my my vocation story is uh, is long. Uh, it kind of goes back to very early on in my uh, in my childhood. My parents uh, emigrated to this country from Ireland, and specifically Northern Ireland. Uh, they left there. They came to this country in the fifties. With a couple of kids already born, um, uh, and they re relocated to California. They left Northern Ireland because to be Catholic in Northern Ireland was not a good thing. Um, uh, you you were uh, uh, oppressed. All the government systems, all the rules were against Catholics and in favor of um, those who were Protestant. And, and it wasn't specifically religious. I will say it had more to do with politics about. Which, which people wanted to continue to be associated with the United Kingdom and which people wanted Northern Ireland to be part of the Republic of Ireland. There's sort of political implications on that. It wasn't purely religious, but, but the religion became a proxy for everything about your identity. And so growing up in Northern Ireland, the first, upon meeting someone, the first question they wanna know is, are you Catholic? It's the first question, that doesn't matter. <laughs> and and uh, because, it was it was an identity that was rooted in them that they they were under attack all the time, and had to be proudly defending who they were and what they believed. The fact that they were Catholic, they wore as a badge of honor, um, proudly. And so, I was blessed to be born into that family with parents who were proudly Catholic, uh, making sure that that their children would have that same benefit. And so uh, the benefit of Catholic schools from, you know, first grade through, actually, I think I made it through law school, even it was Catholic law schools, uh, Catholic grade school, high school, college and law school, um, uh, always keeping in touch with the, with the, with the rational part, the, the reason part of our Catholic faith, but also growing always uh, in, in the spiritual part of our faith. I was, again, blessed by a community of, of support. Uh, I think we all know from, from the stories uh, that we hear of vocations that um, while there are one or two important people in most uh, vocation stories, there is always a, a background of a community. Uh, and I was fortunate to have a community of people who were very supportive of, of young people and their expression of uh, their faith. So being involved with an altar boy as an altar boy and having the priests who had a great interest in you know taking us off to you know go go with them to make hospital visits uh, you know would go out to the cemetery uh, in all of the ministries that they could do uh, where they could where they could appropriately bring along some of the altar altar boys now we would say altar servers altar boys um, they they always did so you you got a sense of what the priests did, which was hidden to many people who don't really know what priests do day to day, what, 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 how do they fill their day. You, you got a sense as an altar boy to go around with them and see what they did and the impact that they could have on people's lives and, and on our community. That was very attractive to me. That was very inspirational to me. So uh, in junior high, actually, well, I guess it was, it was the uh, first year of high school, um, the local uh, seminary had uh, there was a high school division back then of the uh, you could go into you could go into seminary in the high school age, and um, they had a summer program. So I went to uh, I said, well, I think there might be something here. I'd I'd like to go, and of course, family and and parish all were very supportive of that. And I went to St. Vincent's uh, Seminary in uh, in Southern California, and I spent the summer um, uh, in a in a program there to try to discern. Uh, what it was, what, what, what did we like to live in a seminary, and what the seminary life was all about, and, and start to expose us at, at a relatively young age, 15 or 16, to, to that experience. Uh, and it was wonderful, and I, I, I thought very seriously about it uh, throughout my high school years, um, and decided that uh, I'd continue that discernment when I got to college. And so um, when I went to uh, uh, to Georgetown, went from Southern California, where we're growing up, to Georgetown uh, on the East Coast, and um, not, uh, you know, kind of arrived my first day, uh, hadn't seen the place, didn't know anything about the place, showed up with my luggage, you know, in the front door of the university, said, hi, I'm, I'm here, uh, what's this place all about? Um, and with, with echoing in my ears, 
uh, was the word of my pastor. The last words he said to me before I got on the plane to go. Don't let the Jesuits ruin your faith. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, so, uh, so having been there and becoming involved, uh, you know, early on in, in the programs at Georgetown, in, in in campus ministry and and outreach, and being very involved in some of the community outreach programs there, again went through the discernment process with my spiritual director. Um, debated that application uh, at the end of college, debated that application to priestly seminary um, and uh, decided that wasn't the right thing for me to do. At least it wasn't the right thing for me to do at that time. Uh, and went on to, to law school and sort of pushed that idea of a, of, a, of a clerical vocation, just pushed that to the side. Um, continued to be very involved in, in the parish and as uh, a young uh, single man starting my professional career, was uh, as a volunteer, was the director of religious education in our parish out in California with a bunch of Holy Cross priests, actually, Notre Dame. Uh, and uh, so uh, was, was delighted to be part of that program. Met my wife, uh, future wife, um, and we got married. Uh, that, that was the last piece of discernment where I just felt myself called to married life. Um, and we, in, in the courting process, she and I talked about that, that early on, I said, I don't know if I'm going to get married or if I'm going to go into the seminary. I, I still haven't figured that out. And it's appropriate that uh, you were reading about the importance of prayer, because that's what my spiritual directors were telling me at the time is, you will figure this out. God will lead you, but you have to go, uh, you know, ask him. And uh, I, I suppose like most people with uh, a pretty undeveloped or it's called an immature prayer life, uh, my prayer life was uh, was my daily list of giving God things to do. God, if you take this and this and this and this today, that would be terrific. I'll get back to you tomorrow. Um, and and always talking at God, talking to God, but never quieting myself to really listen. And I, my mind was always buzzing with activity. And it was really hard to quiet that, to begin to hear what God was doing. Remember the scripture passage, uh, about God not being in not being in the thunder and the lightning and the earthquake, but being in the gentle breeze that went by, uh, and it was hard to calm myself, to quiet myself, to begin to really hear what God was calling me to do, which was married life, which is a beautiful vocation. Uh, I highly recommend it, uh, uh, and so uh, uh, lived well. It it is it is a wonderful wonderful thing and together with my wife, realizing the importance of what we could help do to help uh, advance the, the mission of Jesus and, and uh, advance the mission of the church uh, through our lives and through our children uh, was, a great, was a great blessing. After, uh, after our children were born, probably in about, I would say, I don't have the exact year, but I would say probably about 2000, we, we moved to Colorado in 2001. Um, and in probably about 2005, um, this call continued uh, to be present. And so uh, my wife, Nellie, and I, we went down and spent, uh, it was a weekend program uh, that they had at the time to go down and, and learn about the diaconate um, uh, formation and whether we were called to be a uh, deacon. And uh, so we went down for an information kind of session. And um, it, was, it was a real struggle in that discernment because while I felt God was calling me um, at the time, our daughters were at home, and they were probably seven and ten. Um, and the commitment to being in formation and being there at the weekends and doing the extra work and the studies and all that thing, um, I, I finally discerned that that my primary vocation, the vocation I had already signed up for, that I had to live fully, was my vocation as husband and as father. And so I was reluctant to sign up to go down to the seminary on the weekends for my vocation, for formation classes when I really felt I needed to be with my daughters in church, modeling that behavior for them uh, for, throughout that time. So, uh, but God never stops calling us. Right? So 10 years later, daughter's grown out of the house. Um, and uh, we went back down again, my wife and I now, we went back down again. And it was this amazing sense of 
piece to down to the information day and said, this is what I, we are called to do. Uh, and so uh, we embarked on that process back in 2016, I think we completed that application process. And um, we finished our formation process, well, our pre-ordination pre formation process, we're still in the post-ordination formation, but our pre-ordination formation process finished last year. Uh, and uh, thanks be to God, uh, I was ordained in June 26th of 2021. Um, and so uh, that, if I can just torture you for another minute, the, the, they told us through formation, right? especially the first year, it, it's all in our formation process, it's all about our spiritual life. Um, and, and it almost mirrors kind of the way we grow in our, in, generally in our spiritual life. We go through those stages. And, and of course, when we show up in our first year, we're, we're spending a lot of time in that purgative uh, stage of trying to, trying to stop some of those bad habits, get rid of the vices we have and start to grow in virtue um, and figure out how to do that in, in and through uh, the grace of God. Um, and with some success, that, that process continues. Right? Um, and after ordination, the Archbishop uh, has, has uh, asked, I think in his wisdom, that we continue in a post-ordination formation. So for three years after our actual ordination date, we continue to be part of a formation process through the seminary uh, to just continue to make sure that, that as we move from being in formation to being ordained, that formation continues so that we land in a good and uh, healthy way at the end of that formation. Most of the, uh, most of the, uh, uh, our friends who are ordained, priests and deacons, tell you the formation never stops, um, but, but at least I can stop going to class and then taking attendance after three years. So, um, Throughout the formation process, at each stage for deacons, our wives have to have to write a handwritten letter to the archbishop saying, I continue to support my husband's vocation to the diaconate, and that this vocation is not, and I can't see that it will, interfere with his first vocation as a husband and father. So cheapishly, at least once a year, I would and a slide a piece of paper across the table with a pen to my wife saying, would you, how do you feel about writing this letter? <laughs> Total veto power, right? Um, when she decides it's time, it's time. Um, which is why that formation process was so important to include wives in the process with us. If she had known then what, what we've experienced now, she might not have signed those letters. Um, the, the, the first year, uh, almost almost year, of uh, my experience as a deacon has been, um, I was just saying, has, has been this amazing uh, constant stream of uh, opportunities for me to grow in trust of God, right? When, when you finish, right, you, you, you get assigned to a parish. Unfortunately for us, we've been parishioners at St. Louis for 20 years and I got assigned to our home parish. So it was pretty comfortable and pretty easy. Uh, you know, people catching you afterwards going, hey, Dan, oh, uh, I mean, Deacon Dan, uh, it's okay, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, but, but, but that challenge of that continued growth um, that, that we have to make. So you show up and you, you, you want to do a good job for the people. You, you, you want to be a good minister. You want, you want to, to do your vocation well. And we tend to have great plans for how to do that, which all involve me. Um, and oh yeah, by the way, I should also ask God to help in the process, right? So God in his good, goodness um, brings us along in a path that encourages us to continue to grow in our trust of him. And uh, so our uh, first year has been, uh, has been tremendously exciting. Um, through uh, the fall and getting involved with a whole bunch of things that, that they don't actually spend a lot of time in formation talking to you about, but you deal with your pastor. And so you start to deal with the, the director of religious education and you start to figure out what's the role of the deacon in all of this. How do you help and support without 
you know, messing things up too, too much um, and uh, plugging yourselves into those opportunities. And the first time you get up and start to speak to people, um, it's daunting, it's challenging, right? Uh, you're not sure what you're going to say. And, and that trust in the spirit to give us the words, uh, to give us the grace that we need uh, is essential, is essential in what we do. So you start with this beginning to trust more and more. Uh, and then for us, in our, in our experience, we, uh, in the Marshall fires on December 30th, uh, we lost our home, uh, it was totally destroyed. Our daughters were home visiting us at uh, Christmas. Uh, so we were there on December 30th. And so um, the four of us kind of evacuated uh, out of the house. Uh, and it was short notice. We didn't really grab anything. We grabbed a, a backpack or a briefcase and we ran out of the house. And, uh, we weren't really expecting. We're you know, in Louisville, in a suburb of Louisville. We're not up, up in the hills where these wildfires hit, right? We're, we're down here in Louisville. We'll probably be home for breakfast. It's not a big deal. You know? uh, didn't work out that way. Um, the the uh, and I don't know why, but uh, the spirit moved me to say I'm going to go as we evacuate the house. I'm going to go to the parish church. Uh, and so uh, Father uh, Tim was still there. They hadn't really evacuated down at the, at the parish office yet. And so, well. Uh, What's the plan? What are we going to do? And we decided that it really was time for us to move on. And Father turned and looked at me and said, what about Jesus? I said, yeah, I'm praying to Jesus. No, 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 no. What about Jesus? What about Jesus? We have to take Jesus out of the tabernacle. <laughs> We're going to evacuate Jesus too. Um, and, uh, and so I had the great privilege of evacuating Jesus. Uh, you know, uh, what, what, what a wonderful, you know, just here, I'm gonna take everything out of the tabernacle and drive uh, and hauled up uh, at nat at nativity, drove over to nativity, was trying to reach someone there. Um, and I was uh, in the parking lot talking to a very uh, lovely person who was answering the phone and said, well, we, we might not we might not be the the nearest parish. I said, "Oh no, you're the nearest parish to me because I'm in your parking lot, um, and I and, and I have Jesus here, and and he's looking for a room." Uh, they were very gracious and allowed us allow us to uh, to put Jesus into the tabernacle there there in nativity. But it but it it you know kind of helps with that perspective of what's important uh, and uh, that. That, uh, that evening, we were in a hotel, a couple of hotel rooms. My daughters were in one, and my wife and I were in the other. My daughters were following all the fire on social media, and they were, they were a wreck, an emotional wreck. They're in their 20s, and uh, they both had apartments in Omaha. Uh, they had gone to Creighton. Uh, they both had apartments in Omaha, and uh, we were getting ready to send them home, back to, back to Omaha. Uh, but they were, they were really emotional, and, and I was doing the dad thing, right? The, Oh, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. It'll, it's, it'll all work out. You know, we're not sure it's really burned down. The fact that ten websites are saying it's burned down doesn't mean it's burned down. We're still could explain it. Miracles happen. We don't really know. Um, finally, after I'd been saying this for a couple hours, my wife very gently reached over, just kind of patted my hand, and said, "It's not okay." <laughs> I kept saying, "It's okay. It's not okay." But it will be, um, and and it's that moment, right, of God speaking to me to say, um, uh, as I like to say, a little bit poetically, we were homeless but not hopeless, right? Uh, we we still had great hope in what God was doing, right? And and we realized that that our true home wasn't wasn't touched by the fire, wasn't scorched, wasn't even damaged, right? Our true home. Uh, is still safe and secure, the one that we're, we're aiming to go to uh, eventually, all of us. Um, and so that, that experience uh, of, of about 30, 35 families in our parish uh, also lost their homes. That's part of what God was doing, right? Uh, not, didn't make my wife smile when, when the next week, Father uh, Tim, our pastor, was giving a homily, and he said, if you're looking for 
God's love in all of this. If your house is burned down or you're evacuated from your house, you can't get back in because of smoke damage. You're here in the parish and you're really, and you're looking for God's love in all of this. God started preparing Deacon Dan to be here 20 years ago, right? And he started in formation five years ago and he ordained him a year ago and he got assigned to this parish, right? He's here having gone through all of that so that he can walk with me. That's God's love for all of you. Uh, my wife kind of said, if I'd known that was the deal, <laughs> uh, you didn't really disclose that to me. And so, and so I have this great uh, opportunity, this great ministry, right, to walk with people who are going through this thing. Uh, and and it's, it's a ton of no fun um is what it is and and reminding people all the time we're saying well you know where is god's love in this well god's love is in is in the people from this parish who, who you know who, who took up collections and, and donated clothes and food and and from every parish around the archdiocese uh the, the people who are there to, to to physically give you a hug and support you while you, while you just want to you know get reduced into tears that that is the tangible manifestation of god's love right um, it's gone on, of course, uh, that uh, we bump, bouncing around between different houses. Uh, well, it's going to take however long it takes, two or three years to get our house rebuilt. Uh, so we're now in a rental house. And uh, in March, just before Holy Week, uh, my wife fell down the stairs, was in the hospital for two weeks, broke her, broke her elbow, broke her ankle, and <laughs> was in a wheelchair because she couldn't get around. So just before Holy Week, really, God, <laughs> this is your sense of humor? And uh, there, there were lots of times uh, when I felt like it was too much. It, it, it was almost too much, but it never was. Right? The, the, uh, I remember during the Triduum, during the veneration of the cross, uh, I had the privilege of, of just, you know, it was a cross probably about five or six feet tall, just a plain wood cross that people were processing up to, to venerate. And I had the privilege of just holding the cross in place while, while people venerated. But that time of people coming up took a little time. And so standing there, holding that cross, leaning my head into it for the 20 minutes or so that people were coming up was a beautiful spiritual moment in my life where I felt the weight of the crosses in my life and was standing thinking about this cross that I was holding and opening myself to God in that moment reminded me that he had carried a cross much heavier, but not just that, it's not a comparison game. The real point was he never asked me to carry that cross alone. He never asked me to carry the cross alone. So that with my wife and my kids and our parish community and our family and friends, I can carry those crosses, right? They bring us closer to God. They let us in to see him in a, in a different way. And so as I approach the first anniversary uh, of my ordination coming up next week, um, I am so grateful for what God continues to do uh, in my life uh, and so grateful for his call to do this ministry. I'm excited about the opportunity to continue to work with, with people uh, who have lost their homes in this community and in the Boulder County, but, um, but also now to reach out to others who are going through that, whether you know, we, when we evacuated for the NCAR fires there a couple months ago, down at the emergency center talking to people about, I, I got the opportunity to go meet people and talk to them and, and say, I have walked a bit of this path, but let's share together how God loves you through this, right? How even in this, it feels like God doesn't love you. Even in this, I can talk to you about God's love. It's true. It's real. It's there. So it's been a, uh, it's been a wonderful, challenging uh, year for me. And uh, I'm, great, I'm grateful for that. Uh, where I've landed in my vocation and 
who knows where God will take me next in terms of my vocation. But I'm intensely grateful that, uh, that God was persistent in his call from the time I was eight or 10, calling me to think about uh, clerical life. And it only took 50 plus years for me to answer the call. Uh, <laughs> but he's relentless. He always chases after us, right? That he goes after the lost sheep and continues to chase after each one of us, calling us to our best self, our true vocation. And so I'm grateful for that.